Wuhan, Iraq WMD, weapons of mass destruction, the suitability of artificial intelligence to different analysis problems. That's what we square up on in this podcast. Tune in. This is AI for Leaders by AI Leaders. Practical, to the point content, helping you drive results with AI. Here's Chris and Frank. Hi, welcome to the AI for Leaders podcast. I'm Frank Strickland. I'm Chris Whitlock. In our last episode, we took a national security incident, the Chinese balloon, uh, and we used it to draw out some principles for leading AI and also to help uh, national security leaders and AI practitioners especially increase their domain knowledge uh, on remote sensing and technical intelligence. Uh, Chris, in this episode, we're going to do something similar. We're going to take some reporting that has come out in the past week uh, on the origin of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus that causes COVID-19, and we're going to use that to promote some lessons. Talk to us about uh, that news. Uh, let me bring that up, actually, Frank. Hang on one moment. It was a great article. This is in the Wall Street Journal, and many will have heard of it uh, over the weekend. Uh, the Wall Street Journal published an exclusive article, for those that can't see, uh, Lab Leak, Most Likely Origin of COVID-19 Pandemic, Energy Department Now Says. Uh, U.S. Agency's revised assessment is based on new intelligence. So this has prompted a lot of discussion, uh, as you would expect, given the prominence of the pandemic, COVID, et cetera. But there's an interesting backstory on this article, and it is not apparent in the headline. And it really helps us, I think, Frank, to think about where AI plays. We can use this effort in the intelligence community to illustrate some boundaries and uh, also add some other items that I think create context for people and understanding where does AI play and how can you take some of the structure of a typical AI problem and use it to think about others that may not lend themselves exactly, if that makes sense. Uh, it does. I think it's fantastic. Uh, let's dive in. So when when we think about AI and what problems are suitable, we have several factors we have in view. I have a slide for those who can see it on the screen. For those who cannot, there are several big factors we would immediately look at if we're working with a team or a group that is thinking about AI. And the first one is the mission problem itself without belaboring that. Is it a mission task, a pretty specific task, or is it a more complex problem? Uh, that is a crucial upfront issue. Uh, how narrow is this task versus a larger problem? How often does it happen? Frequency and demand. So if I have a task that occurs a lot and takes a lot of time, that starts to shape up as pretty good. What's the data volume like? And that's data volume both to train an AI model uh, and then just your data volume on a recurring basis. You want to use machines. We want to use AI when we got a lot of volume, right? Uh, work at machine speed and scale the process to machine capacity vice human eyeballs and human brains. But we also have to think about another factor. The fourth one is data readiness. And there are often problems which require a good bit of conditioning even if I have enough data, there may be a good bit of prep before it's AI ready. The and vast lastly, majority of problems, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how you think of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then the last factor in AI deployment is having a clear integration path. You know what? How would you get this in, into operation? But those to me, Frank, are, are big ones. Uh, any other thoughts you have uh, on on that before we, we go farther as far as the big criteria when we think about what's suitable for AI and what things are broadly under the analysis umbrella, but they don't really go there. Yes. So what what problems are 
suited, well suited, take these five criteria, leaders can use those and you don't have to be an AI practitioner to, to use these criteria. Right. And then we're going to take some broad, more general analytical problems and, and look at the application or not of AI to those problems. I like that. I, I would illustrate for me, Frank, uh, personally, just living aspects of this. When I finished in the military service, I came to the CIA. I was an analyst there. My first job was as an imagery analyst. We did analysis. And daily, I would get images fed to me, which I was required to interpret or look at. And a lot of that was counting and identifying objects in those scenes annotating that in a database. I'm old. This was in the late 1980s. You know, we're in the Cold War, but that was the nature of imagery analysis work. Uh, we had very important targets we wanted to monitor. I would look at those targets daily, count, identify, characterize what was going on. I moved from that inside the, the CIA to become an all-source intelligence analyst. And there we were writing for the president's daily brief, the national intelligence daily, different functional and regional publications on military topics. The complexion of those two types of work was very different. And the suitability of AI to those different types of work was very different. Let me, let me use some slides and see if we can illustrate for people. Hey, Chris, real quick before yeah. you do that. So a couple of points for our listeners, we're going to use some intelligence analysis examples, and you just talked about your background in intelligence analysis, but in the national security enterprise, there are analytical activities taking place all over the enterprise. All over, all, all over. Yeah. yeah. And min, many of those uh, are intelligence in their orientation, not just in the intelligence community, but in Customs and Border Protection and the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Drug Enforcement Agency. But, but there are analytical activities that go well beyond intelligence. Their human capital uh, and management of people, their management of material, just there is analysis that is occurring everywhere. And analysis, in my view, Chris, is the foundational discipline on which data science and AI rests. You are I think that's a, a great, great way to think science. about it, right? The the umbrella activity is analysis. Yes. And we can throw any number of other fancy pants terms around, but the umbrella activity is analysis. Some of what happens under that analysis umbrella lends itself to machine learning, to artificial intelligence, to advanced statistical applications, et cetera. Not all of it, right? Not all of it. And that's the point is get, get yourself comfortable with what lends itself to AI suitability and these factors that we're talking about. So with right. that as background, let me just share um, a slide or two that will give people an idea. Uh, this first one is, uh, for those that can't see the screen, it's... It reprises periodically. It's probably a 2017 uh, or 18 image that was uh, created by Teeny Biscuit. Um, but it floats <laughs> around in the data science community, and it's a 16-block image. Some of the images are blueberry muffins at different angles, and some of the images are chihuahuas uh, and even different breeds of of chihuahuas. But what it was illustrating in a, fun, in a funny way at the time is these are the kinds of factors that will confound AI and make it hard for um, a machine learning or, or image processing solution in AI to work. The bigger message I think for everyone here, though, that we want to emphasize is this is a form of classification. So in the family of machine learning and artificial intelligence, there are different types of um, uh, approaches, and this one falls under what we would call classification. So we want to look at the objects in this 16-block array and classify them. Is that a blueberry muffin? Is it a dog? Uh, is it a chihuahua? Uh, specifically, if we wanted to bore down into the classification. That's a really common application for AI. Is it and this me, or that? 
this yeah. is it or this that? or that yeah. and it's also a really common application in any form of analysis right so here we're taking ones that are friendly to ai uh check this next example for those that can see the screen uh, this is from a developmental activity to detect improvised explosive devices uh this particular image pairing is in the public space and it came out during the war years but what it shows is a reflection of development activity we had at the time in the national security community in the left-hand image to develop a synthetic aperture radar that could detect the potential emplacement of IEDs, improvised explosive devices. On the right-hand image is an electro-optical camera, more the way our eyes would normally see rendered in black and white. But the point of both of these, this was an automatic target recognition set of solutions. So I don't want to have to have humans look at this like I did in my early imagery analysis job. We want to fly the aircraft, take the images, and automatically recognize potential targets in the scene. And then humans can review those. That's a classification problem. Uh, you're, you're detecting and recognizing, but you're, it's a classification kind of problem. Now, another one, totally different to Frank's point. Frank, what you were talking about earlier, uh, for those that can't see it, this is a view of an aircraft engine. Predictive maintenance in the logistics arena is a huge application for AI. It has nothing to do with intelligence. It has uh, nothing to do with combat per se. It's the combat service support activity to keep all of our gear at the ready. There has been a lot of work in multiple domains, aviation, locomotives, uh, automobiles, uh, to use artificial intelligence or machine learning applications to get in front of maintenance problems. So in this particular instance, this is a European concern, but what they had done was to shift from fixed maintenance schedules to look at streaming operational data and classify aircraft or subsystems on the aircraft that were of higher risk of near-term equipment failure. So rather than maintaining the aircraft only on a fixed cycle, then you're beginning to bump it forward by classifying those aircraft or systems with higher risk. And that would be a logistics kind of application. Nice. Now, the, the last one that I think, Frank, is useful, those first two, one was very image-based, IEDs. Uh, the second one, logistics, you can use a lot of streaming sensor data, telemetry data from components on an aircraft. What's on the screen for those who can't see it is just an illustration in natural language processing of two types of classification approaches that are, are common. On the left-hand side, imagine that your mission problem is, I want to monitor political activity in a country or region and what I am looking for are indicators of civil unrest. Well, there are particular families of natural language processing models that we can use for that uh, topic modeling techniques. And you can envision a very simple classification scheme underneath of that. I look at a document and what I'm trying to classify are any indicators of unrest. So do I have that? Classify those and then classify the rest of the content as categories of normal political activity. It may be disagreement, uh, et, et cetera, dissonance around a certain policy, but it's not an indicator of unrest. That's a classification scheme. Yeah. In the same way, maybe more relatable is recruiting. Like you take military recruiting and we want to know how people are responding to ads. Are they responding positively? Or is this more neutral or negative? No, it's a classification kind of approach. Yeah. If that rings, Frank. It does. It's We've set up well, Chris. That was a nice setup of these this or that questions. And we're going to go to a couple of examples now of of Intel problems. But they're, they're big analytical problems. Uh, and it's going to hinge on classifying is it this or is it that? 
uh, and we'll discuss the potential application of AI or not to those classification decisions. Oh, that's perfect. Uh, let me pull that, pull that up here. So as you're pulling that up, Chris, um, we're going to look at the Iraqi uh, WMD national intelligence estimate and then a commission that the president charged with looking at the failure of that estimate and arguably certainly one of the principal factors many would argue the principal factor that took us to war with iraq in 2003 mm -hmm. and we're going to see this classification challenge and problem was something this or that but let's do a little bit of setup, Chris. So first of all, um, let's remind our listeners, August the 2nd, 1990, Saddam Hussein, the late Saddam Hussein, is the dictatorial leader of Iraq. Uh, and he goes to war with Kuwait. He invades Kuwait, basically <clears throat> crushes the Kuwaiti military, sees the Kuwaiti oil fields, and President Bush, the first President Bush, goes on television and and makes a very famous policy declaration in a speech with the sentence, this will not stand. Uh, and at that point, all of us in the national security enterprise knew we're going to war. Um, I got a call from U.S. Central Command, which interestingly today, most people think of CENTCOM in Tampa which is the command in the military that's responsible for the Middle Eastern area of responsibility broadly. Back in 1990, 1991, Central Command was pretty sleepy. Uh, it was pretty sleepy. Uh, nothing like it is today. But um, I was sitting in one of those technical intelligence programs where Chris and I grew up. We were building uh, algorithms and software applications um, in the late 80s, mid to late 80s, and continued on. And uh, net, net, I got a call from Central Command and myself and a tech sergeant and a contractor that worked for me. I was a government employee at the time. We show up at CENTCOM on the 5th of August with the first near real-time uh, remote sensing intelligence data that they had there at Central Command and ultimately took that forward. But the net of that event is after the U.S. military crushed the Iraqi army in what was known as Operation Desert Storm, we were able to get direct access to a lot of the weapons facilities and documentation and scientists and really go beyond what intelligence collection can normally do in that we had direct control uh, in many cases and direct access uh, to these uh, facilities and people. Uh, and what happened in that assessment is a big surprise for the intelligence community, and it was a bad surprise, a shocking surprise. And the surprise was that the judgments of the intelligence community up to that point had greatly underestimated the maturity of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction program. So the intelligence community gets hit in the face in 1991 with this big surprise. Oh, the Iraqis were much farther along in developing a nuclear weapon as one illustration of WMD, one facet of WMD. And it was a big surprise. And needless to say, you know, getting surprised about the development of a nuclear weapon is not a very good surprise. And it's okay. worthwhile, Frank, just uh, to emphasize for those that work in national security, but not immediately in intelligence, not all the problems are equally easy to work, right? If you look across the range of topics that analysts are assigned to and where AI may get deployed, they're not all equally easy to work. So, yeah, I'm with you. That shocker in the 90s was a wake up. And, and certainly uh, you can imagine how that resets people's posture. Yeah, if you kind of make a quick analogy between, say, Iraq in that period and North Korea today, we don't have CIA officers running around on the ground in North Korea recruiting North Korean assets the way we might in some other countries where we have embassies and consulates, et cetera. We're trying to sense these weapons development activities uh, from a distance 
uh, we are trying to recruit spies um, in different ways in different areas. But yeah, Chris, you make the point. It, it's a really hard problem, really hard problem. So the second factor, you've got the big surprise. Uh, don't move off that yet, Chris. We're going to do a little bit more setup here. The, the second factor that uh, contextualizes this problem um, is that we had a period then from 1991 uh, until the late 90s and early 2000, 2001, where Saddam Hussein obstructed the international inspectors who were charged with monitoring uh, the weapons of mass destruction program in Iraq. So you have a big surprise and you have Saddam Hussein directly obstructing an agreed to set of inspection regimes in order to ensure that nuclear, biological, chemical weapons uh, were not reconstituted. So that's sort of the, the broad context in which we land. Um, and so in October 2002, um, the so after, intelligence- after 9-11 yeah, happens. In, in the wake of 9-11. Right, we've, we've invaded Afghanistan. Invaded and Afghanistan. And now people are dealing with Iraq. Yeah. And and leading up just even prior to 9-11, you've got a group of intelligence analysts. And Chris, I'm going to ask you to characterize this. You've got a group of analysts that are working on a national intelligence estimate around Iraq's WMD program. So, again, think we've had a decade since the 1991 access and surprise, we've got a lot of obstruction of the inspectors. And so the intelligence community produces this national intelligence estimate or NIE on Iraq's WMD programs. What is what is an NIE, Chris, and kind of roughly how does that work? Well, I, I have only worked on a couple, uh, Frank, in my career. So in my time at CIA as a military analyst, uh, I was part of a branch. Our branch worked uh, a particular focus in Central America. And there was is a group, it is referred to as the National Intelligence Council, which falls under the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And periodically, either at the request of uh, the executive branch or something that they do proactively, the NIC will have one of its designated national intelligence officers coordinate production of a community document, and that is an NIE, a National Intelligence Estimate. Uh, the couple that I was around, one of my colleagues in a branch actually was the lead drafter for, but they are designed to be a representation of the best thinking in the community. So you will have a lead drafter, but then many participants. And depending on how controversial the topic is, a lot of discussion, right? Because the data in some instances can be interpreted in varying ways, and that can lead to some sporty conversations. Uh, in my experience, uh, great process and plenty of debate uh, to get to consensus positions, sometimes with objections that were explicitly noted. But that's an NIE. An NIE represents the best thinking in the community at that point in time on a particular topic, either at the request of the White House or uh, something they do proactively. So, Chris, if you'll pop that slide back up then. So in October 2002, it just happened that the NIE was in work for several months, but it, it was produced in October 2002. And for those that can see the screen, those that can't, we've just got the cover, the redacted cover of the NIE on the left-hand side here. And, and it was on Iraq's, and the title is telling, Iraq's Continuing Programs for Weapons of Mass Destruction. So you don't need to be an analyst. Uh, you just need to be able to speak English at kind of a Kentucky level, which would be my level, to infer Iraq's continuing programs for weapons of mass destruction. The title itself is communicating something. So, Huge go-to-war influencing document right here. Yeah, yeah. You, you have a number of conversations going on in the go-to-war decision, but the belief that 
that Iraq had reconstituted its WMD programs, and we're going to focus on nuclear here as an example, big, big influence in the 2003 invasion decision. So we, we invade, we again defeat the Iraqi army, we've got direct access, there's a group called the Iraq Survey Group that we'll come back to in just a moment, but it has direct access, and it goes through and finds the intelligence was all wrong. Um, not and only this will be like model training at some level, right? <laughs> yes. We we've used AI to make a model prediction. Now we test it against the reality in in the world. This was not done with AI, but it's same deal. And you get an acid test check with the Iraqi Survey Group. Yes. So this commission document that you see on the right hand side for those that can't see, we've just got the Commission on the Intelligence Capabilities of the United States regarding weapons of mass destruction. This is a commission that the president requested. We've previously talked about congressionally requested uh, commissions, but uh, this is a commission that the president directed. Um, it was chaired by a longtime appellate judge, uh, Silberman, co-chaired by the judge Silberman and um, Senator Chuck Robb. Um, Senator Robb had served on the Intelligence Committee in the Senate, uh, on the Armed Services Committee, and on the Foreign Affairs Committee, which are the three principal committees dealing with national security. The, the point we would just quickly make there about this commission and, and all of them, uh, as we'd say back home in Kentucky, the commissioners didn't walk out of the cotton fields yesterday. Um, Bill Studeman, Admiral Bill Studeman, William Oliver Studeman, uh, was one of the 10 commissioners. Uh, he was a former director of NSA. He was the deputy director of CIA when I was there on the director of CIA staff. He is a thoroughgoing, deeply qualified, professional career intelligence officer. So this commission does an assessment. We're going to go into the nuclear portion of that and look at a lesson learned on this classification issue. Of course, if you would just click forward. So here is the net net. This is from the body of the commission report. I'm going to also cite uh, some language from the cover letter of the commission to the president. But war is looming. You know, we've had the 9-11 attacks. By the way, we also in 2001, if you recall, had the anthrax, atta anthrax attacks. There were five people killed uh, in those attacks. And the uh, decontamination damage uh, control reached about a billion dollars was the estimate. So, so the country was in kind of a psychic shock at this point. And so as all of that is going on, this October 2002 estimate uh, comes out and it, it asserts that Iraq has reconstituted its nuclear weapons uh, program, as you can see here, and could assemble a device by the end of the decade. Uh, and then, you know, a little bit further in the body, this is the stinging quote. These assessments were all wrong. In the cover letter to the president, um, two big points I draw out. One, uh, the the uh, the commission said the estimates were dead wrong. And then importantly, in the cover letter to the president, the commissioner said they found no evidence, no evidence that any intelligence analyst or anyone in the intelligence community had deliberately distorted the intelligence. They were just simply wrong and they were wrong in large part because of a failure in a classification of a this or that decision that we're called it a ferocious chihuahua when it was really a blueberry month. <laughs> I, you know, on this, you know, in 2023, I, I get it. Yeah. We kind of chuckle at that it. analogy, but but yes, that that is the analogy. And, and it is not. Uh, yeah, in no way would I. These people were working a very hard problem. They made the call as best they could. A ton of learning that came after that. Also a ton of negative uh, repercussions. But to me, yeah, that sums it up. It was a this or that kind of proposition. They broke the wrong direction. Yes, badly. Uh, if you go to the next page, Chris. So here's the, uh, the summary of the nuclear weapons finding uh, for those that are listening and can't see. 
I'm just going to read a couple of sentences uh, from the commission report. The misjudgment stemmed chiefly from the community's failure to analyze correctly Iraq's reasons for attempting to procure high strength aluminum tubes. And this is the root you're saying of the this or that problem. Yeah. So in March of 2001, the intelligence community had reporting, so it had collected and reported that Iraq was attempting to acquire a large number of aluminum tubes that are made with a special alloy, a certain strength of aluminum. And so the question became, are they trying to re uh, acquire these tubes so that they can use them to enrich uranium? Uh, they're going to be part of centrifuges to enrich uranium, or are they missile tubes for their 81 millimeter rocket engines? Okay, so is it this or that? Um, and without taking you through all of the analysis, the, the commission report has a great case study on this. Fundamentally, what the community did, and it was led by judgments by CIA and by DIA, as well as the Army's component of the intelligence community, the National Ground Intelligence Center, or INJIC, as it is known in the community, is the community in the commission's judgment went from a hypothesis, you know, it could be this, it could be for centrifuges, to a presumption that it is for centrifuges. And that obviously is a fine intellectual line, but as an illustration, the community, and in this case, I'll just use an NGIC example, began to either intentionally or unintentionally block out information that could have allowed them to pursue the classification this or that alternative hypothesis in more detail. For example, in 1996, the Iraqis declared to international weapons inspectors that they had 81 millimeter rocket tubes with this type of aluminum alloy. Uh, moreover, Russia, Switzerland, and about 12 other countries had used aluminum tubes with this alloy for rocket engines. So there was evidence out there. The evidence wasn't suppressed. There's no conspiracy here. Those of you who might have tinfoil hats, hopefully not many of our listeners, but you could kind of put those away now. Um, there was no conspiracy. There was just a failure to pursue the alternative hypothesis. And in a classification decision, you have an alternative hypothesis. It could be this, a tube used for centrifugal force to separate isotopes and gas so that you can create a uranium gas mixture that ultimately leads to weapons grade uranium or it could be for 81 millimeter right. uh, rocket tubes. And, and that, I think, Frank, that's the deal. And to me, just taking care not to overly criticize people who are doing that. Their job is to risk mitigate for the United States. So some of them are going to be oriented to a conservative posture. The point here, and to me, it's, it's the point around AI applicability, but ultimately to COVID, we went to war around this decision. The, this or that, this particular decision, which could not be made by AI, it had a gigantic impact on the go-to-war calculus. Yeah. And if you, that, that if you, to me, is the message made with moderate confidence, uh, yes. P.S., by the yes. way. Yes. And uh, if you flip forward to the next page, Chris, so – you have the 2003 invasion. Again, we, like 91, we get physical access. And this Iraq survey group that, that we um, mentioned earlier were charged with a number of things. And one of them was assessing the degree to which there were weapons of mass destruction and production and operational capabilities in Iraq. And, and the net net was they didn't find it. They didn't find it on the nuclear side. They didn't find it in other WMD cases. Um, and in fact, their judgment was that in the case of these aluminum tubes, to quote, 
uh, from the commission report, the ISG concluded that Iraq's effort to procure the tubes is best explained by its efforts to produce 81 millimeter rockets. Okay, so two points to make here. Uh, Chris alluded to one. Extraordinarily difficult um, analyses um, and analyses that don't lend themselves well to AI in this particular case. Chris, Meaning I'm to reminded make that judgment. Is it this or that? Or that? Yeah. The it, mission Chris, task is really complex. This doesn't occur every day. Yeah. Right? Data is not necessarily right, et cetera. Back to those suitability factors. Yeah. And before we get to the second element, Chris, I want to mention here, lest anybody think that point is too straightforward. Um, I, I was in a group of about 150 to 200 uh, people from government and industry that had gathered about five years ago oh, to talk oh, about the application yeah, of, I remember, of AI. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a very senior intelligence officer stood up in front of that group, and this is a near verbatim quote. We need to move beyond talking about what our problems are. We know what our problems are. Our problems are North Korea, China, Iran, you know, et cetera. Um, I, I don't, I, I know this individual. I admire him. I, I don't think he he probably would if he that had was an not opportunity stated with tremendous clarity no. in that moment. That was not stated with tremendous clarity. Yeah. And so this area of problem definition, it would be easy to leap over that for leaders and say, uh, it, yeah, let's get on to the model. Do you have training data? Uh, show me what your you know testing looks like. Uh, what type of model are we using here? Uh, it, it's easy to leap past the problem definition. Chris, you and I were talking with an executive who is a master data scientist, and and he is a, a technical fellow in a very large company recently. And you ask him, you know, in the project life cycle, you know, where he thought the train could most come off the track and problems be injected in an AI project. And the first thing he went to was problem definition. So, yeah. so the, the problem definition here, uh, really important. The second thing we want to quickly mention, and Chris, you implied this, but we want to foot stomp it a bit. The intelligence community did a really great job after this of scrubbing itself very hard and making systemic changes to the Phenomenal analytical job. process. Phenomenal so, so these sort of mistakes, and we're going to see that uh, in this next example in just a second, these sort of mistakes, um, it, it really did a lot to systemically uh, root out the causes of those mistakes. Uh, one last lesson from the commission report here that we'll highlight on this page. Um, uh, the commission notes that it's it's a very difficult task in making these judgments, but it, it uh, and I'll quote from the commission report that um, the intelligence community should have been more candid about what it did not know. They can be faulted for not telling policymakers just how little evidence they had to back up their inferences and how uncertain that evidence was. So, again, I think AI leaders can see a connection there um, to. I know, think that's huge. That critique, you know, can critique the this or that, but also how did you communicate this information? to policy makers, were they really hip to the deficiencies in the data status, et cetera? So we're being clear to me, this was not an AI friendly problem, but it is illustrative because AI follows under the analysis umbrella, particular kinds of problems will lend themselves to machine learning and AI solutions. I believe they've learned, I believe this lesson has been processed and I believe it is fully manifest in the COVID NIE, the COVID National Intelligence Estimate. Um, and that to me is really encouraging when you look at it, but it's also just a foot stomper. What data do you actually have? That's certainly relevant to creating an AI model or not, but it's also relevant in conveying analytic results. Yeah, Chris, be, as you go to the COVID example, I would give just one other, and we could cite many examples, uh, but one that all of our listeners will resonate with. The, the decision by the president to conduct 
to order the strike operation that brought Osama bin Laden to justice in Abbottabad, Pakistan, um, as an illustration of the application of lessons learned. And obviously that was one of the more sensitive intelligence operations and military operations that one could imagine. Um, there was a red team that was formed at one point in the process before the president made the go decision. And the red team was charged with looking at potential flaws in the evidence and in the analytic approach. Yeah. So, yep. it, so the intelligence community has, has really worked hard and you can see it in that example. And you're going to see it in this COVID example to apply lessons learned uh, from that WMD failure. Yeah. These are not unsmart and unserious people who are working these issues. They are complex issues. And yeah. I think the COVID one is a great illustration. You know, we are so prone collectively to passion on this for understandable reasons, but it just illustrates Underneath the analysis umbrella, some things lend themselves to machine learning and AI, but they all can be structured, whether AI friendly or not, they get structured. The screen you're seeing here for those that look at it is a summary graphic from the National Intelligence Estimate on the origins of COVID-19. It was published in 2019, and they have three big buckets that they summarize here. What are our broad areas of agreement? So the many participants in the intelligence community, what are our broad areas of agreement? Second, what are the two plausible hypotheses on initial human exposure? So how did COVID get into the wild? And that's what this Wall Street Journal article was addressing on Sunday, right? With the, with the news that Department of Energy has changed its position uh, to uh, uh, different than, than previous. And then the last area uh, in the NIE is around China's cooperation. But let me quickly summarize a couple of things that are important. So in the NIE, which they have unclassified largely and released, you can read it, a citizen can read it, right? Where the community is comfortable is that this virus was not developed as a biological weapon and they are comfortable that the virus was not genetically engineered. Um, so those are important things and they kind of push that off to the side then with some other things that are, are broadly agreed. What's material, and it's in the Wall Street Journal article, is how did this get into the wild and what they articulated in the National Intelligence Estimate? And you can imagine how policymakers, because they're doing it right now, right? Politicians are talking about this right now. Um, if it's a big difference, is this natural transmission? Is it a lab incident? Because they've already dealt with, eh, this is not a genetically engineered bioweapon. We're all comfortable. That is not the case. So how did it get into the wild? Right. It, is it this or that? A blueberry muffin, a chihuahua. Right. Is it an IED? Is it not an IED? Um, can we, do we need to accelerate the maintenance or not? It's a classification problem. The same kind of structure while not AI friendly. And I think, Frank, this NIE captures a couple of important things. And it, it would be a critique that I would have of the Wall Street Journal headline. DOE <laughs> changed its position, in effect, looking at the center of this chart to say, eh, we think it's most likely now that this is a laboratory associated event with low confidence. Right. With low confidence. I failed. I failed to, I, again, I'm. It's not in the headline. I, I, right? I read slowly, with, with but I low didn't see confidence. that in the headline. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, it's part of the information environment we live in, et cetera. You got to write a headline that grabs people's attention. And it's actually been a critique of the president's daily brief. You can pack a lot into a headline. You don't want to make a headline deceptive. I would argue that that headline is not as potent as it could be. Yes, they now, of these two options, judge a lab-associated incident is most likely with low confidence, not with moderate yeah, confidence, just, not with high confidence, with low confidence. Right, and Chris, you just, you just, you walk through, you know, the community makes these 
analytical judgments and somewhat like our AI listeners would really live in an, in a probabilistic world and think of everything in a probabilistic, not a deterministic way, these intelligence analysts are assigning this confidence level to their judgments to communicate to the policy leaders uh, something other than, you know, a mistaken Wall Street Journal headline. And a lot of AI models or machine learning models will kick out a similar thing. I might flag a case, an uh, application, a part order, whatever. And in doing that, a model might even assign a score, right, to, to that particular item. Hey, there is an X probability that this is a an apple, you know, right. pick, pick, pick an object. Your point about probabilistic reasoning is important and probability and stats underpin everything in AI. So under the, AI, you know, the analysis umbrella, some activities lend themselves to machine learning and AI. All of that is very statistically and probabilistically oriented. Yeah. Now, here is another thing, and I'll just quickly show it. But it illustrates growth over time. It also is very important as it pertains to AI suitability and also how we interpret these judgments. The National Intelligence Estimate that was written on the origins of COVID emphasize, unlike the WMD NIE in 2002, they emphasize we have gaps in our knowledge of naturally occurring coronaviruses. Now, when, when they say that, that's not a couple of jamokes who fell off the pumpkin truck yesterday and the, right. decided they would wake up and write an NIE on COVID-19. These are people that are highly connected in the intelligence community to biological-related defense preparations, bioweapons defense preparations, to academia, and they have great plugins to academia to get information. And what they're reflecting in the NIE is their best thinking, and they're, they're being plain with policymakers. Look, you know, we're being asked to opine on something here where there is a lot of ambiguity. And the first paragraph underneath that illustrates a facet of it, which is it's really hard to detect certain of these changes. Um, and we can't tell on the right hand side, I'll just read this for those who cannot see, it will be difficult to increase our confidence that the distinguishing features in SARS COVID-2 emerged naturally without a better understanding of the diversity of coronaviruses in nature and how often recombination occurs during co-infection of multiple coronaviruses within a particular host. So they're in the weeds here on yeah. how viruses interact, you know, with carriers, et cetera. But the point is this or that, did this get into the wild naturally or via a lab incident? It's a consequential judgment. The NIE is saying, hey, that's a really hard problem. WMD in Iraq was a really hard problem. Yeah. Leaned forward, made a big judgment, went to war, found out the judgment was wrong. It's just a good note to me, Frank, with these larger complex problems that don't lend to AI, a good dose of humility is in order for everybody, recipient of the data, as well as those creating the product. Yeah, Chris, that just real quick on that, because I would think about my 30 year old self and I would, you know, as a government that. leader, what's that? I remember that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Thankfully, I had uh, a lead analyst like you to keep me in check, but it wasn't it wasn't arrogance as much as just a passion and my personality type as a driver and a pioneer driver. Um, it, it is really important around the complexity of defining problems that are suitable for AI, understanding the providence of data, uh, the analytic approach that is applied, the probabilistic thinking and the use of probabilistic thinking and applying the results. It is really important for leaders, 
have passion. In fact, we we have passion. In fact, we've got passion around the fact that tens of thousands of people in the national security community have got to get trained or we're going to, yeah, friggin' lose this competition to the Chinese Communist Party. Have the passion, but you've got to approach these things with a degree of sobriety uh, and bridles on that passion. Uh, otherwise, you can you can jack something up, you know, pretty badly and potentially jack some things up that cause major damage. Yeah. In, in your passion, in our passion, and even for you and I, in our passion, failing to recognize where there is ignorance or a lack of data is a really potentially fatal flaw. Fine. Be passionate. Wonderful. Glad that you are. Make sure that your your positions are well founded and where there is not data, just be clear, that's your opinion. That's your reasoning to it's get a to hypothesis. a destination. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and there yeah. better be alternatives. This yeah. or that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Blueberry muffins or chihuahuas. Yeah. Right. At the end of the day. And a lot of these problems underneath the analysis arena, some are going to lend to AI and machine learning. Many are not. They're going to be more complex and require a lot of moving parts or AI machine learning might feed a piece of it, but it's not going to make the determination uh, as it will with the automated target recognition for yeah. IEDs that we showed, et cetera. I, I would just recap, Frank. I'll just show this and uh, yeah, we'll get off. I, I think we are nearing beating the horse dead, but the factors that drive AI suitability, if you were taking all of this together, we began with the kind of mission problem. So it's all analysis. What of those analysis problems lend themselves to this? And our assertion would be for the foreseeable future, the more narrow the mission task, the more likely you're going to be able to deploy machine learning and AI. Yep. You're going to want to do that where the frequency is high. That decision or evaluation has to happen a lot. A lot like young me Working an imagery problem where every day I'm looking at the same thing and I'm counting and identifying and characterizing what is there. It takes a lot of time, occurs a lot. Data volume. You've got enough to train a model. Or in this WMD and COVID situation, you've got enough to make a competent judgment, right? Is the data volume sufficient? For AI, it also has to be ready got to be clean enough and prepared enough and you got to have an integration path. Those are issues around AI suitability as they contrast with these larger complex problems that we're going to deal with regularly in the national security community. Mm -hmm. So with that, Frank, I might throw it back to you just to close this up. Nice. So this is what we have done subsequent to writing a book. Chris and I have gone beyond the book's content uh, to build a set, uh, an initial a course called the AI Leaders Course. And for those who can see the screen, what you see here um, is a roadmap of the modules uh, that are in the course. I won't go through all of this. We'll put a link below uh, where anyone, whether you're seeing this or just listening, uh, you can go to YouTube, grab the link and um, learn more about the details of the course, its benefits, its features, etc. But I would just say this. What we're trying to do in this course and subsequent courses that we're going to create is equip data science and AI practitioners to raise their leadership competency because many of them are have no leadership experience or fairly new and very few of them have major program or senior executive level uh, leadership experience. And then we're trying to take national security leaders broadly and those that support those leaders and go through things like we went through today, classification decisions, problem definition, frequency of the problem, these uh, criteria that we went through, and equip those leaders to engage in selecting the most valuable work for AI, resourcing that, assessing Guiding the it. results, yeah. you know, et cetera. And so that's what we're doing. We'll put a link to uh, some information on the course uh, below, and we'll put that out there on our uh, social channels. Um, so in closing, we just ask uh, to the end of trying to have that sort of scale impact quickly across the national security community really helps to get the word out. If you subscribe to the YouTube channel, give this episode a like, uh, share it with colleagues and friends. 
Uh, if you're getting this on uh, Spotify or Apple, please uh, rate and review. Uh, we thank you for your time and attention. Hope this has been helpful to you. Uh, we welcome your feedback uh, on this episode, as well as questions or ideas that you might have for other episodes. Uh, you can respond to us in the social channels, or you can go to our website, AILeaders.com. There's a contact us button there. Uh, and we'll be sure to give due attention to your feedback. So until next time, appreciate you. Indeed.